It is a great pleasure for me to be here again and again. This is not the first time I've been here many times. I must say very honestly that I really admire this institution, ISER Pune, the, the faculty, the students, the teaching program, the research. I've been here many, many times since ISER was set up and it's always a great pleasure to be here. It's very inspiring to be here. Uh, Sutir just told me that this colloquium series has been restarted and it's going to be held three times a month. I wish we could do this in IAS. I wish we could have an institute-wide colloquium several times a month and have audience of this size. It's very, very impressive. I am delighted to have the opportunity to speak to such a large number of people and I thank Sutir for, for this opportunity. I am going to try and do something somewhat complicated today. I work on social insects like ants, bees and wasps, which are fascinating and I often give talks about their behavior and what they do and how we study them, which is sort of very interesting and easy for me to convey and easy for the audience to appreciate. But today I am going to do something slightly more complicated. I am going to go into some theory, I am going to talk about the practice of science, I am going to talk about controversies. So, but I'll try and, and, and keep you interested. And that's why, as you can see, this is called the bitter sweet saga. But of course, let me begin with some very general introduction. Okay, so as I said, I work with social insects. As most of you would know, many species of insects live a social life. They organize themselves into what I think we legitimately call societies. The best examples are ants, bees, wasps, and termites. These societies are in many ways very similar to human societies and in some ways one can argue that they are superior to human societies. They can accomplish many things that we cannot accomplish and they accomplish many things that we probably can accomplish but they do it in a much simpler, much more economical way and therefore it's great interest to study them. So this particular slide is that of, the, of a honeybee but this is indeed a special kind of honeybee. This is the so-called Asian dwarf honeybee. This is, uh, amongst all the honeybees, this is considered very special because it's the only bee that is one step removed from the pinnacle of social evolution. It's not as highly evolved as all the other bees and therefore we think that studying this will help us to understand how those who have reached the pinnacle actually got there. So this is uh, local bee, I took this uh, picture in, uh, my student took this picture in our campus. This is a picture of the three kinds of bees you will find in a honeybee colony. So every colony has three kinds of bees, one and only one large fertile female bee which we call the queen, she is the only one who actually reproduces. A small number of male bees which are called drones and they are best known for their laziness, they do very little. And indeed, we have studied their laziness, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and the rest of the colony, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 individuals are the small worker bees who do all the tasks that are required to maintain and run the colony. They clean the cells, they build the cells, they repair the colony, they guard the nest, they bring food, they process food, they feed it to the young ones, all, everything is done by the workers. What you see here is an enlarged picture with the queen bee in the middle and you can see that she is larger than the rest of the workers. Just to give some intimate details into the social life of these things, what you see in this picture is actually a group of worker bees surrounding the queen bee. In fact, these bees you might say are on royal duty. They surround the queen, queen, they take care of her, they clean her, they lick her, they feed her. She is just too busy to do any of these things herself. She is laying eggs and she can lay thousands of eggs per day and that's what these workers do. If you watch this a little more carefully, you will find something very interesting. These bees which appear to be doing this task very diligently, after a few minutes seem to lose interest and go off and start doing something else. And other bees which are doing something else come back and take their position. So this job of taking care of the queen is done in short shifts of a few minutes at a time. And it turns out that this is of great advantage because by doing so, a very large fraction of the worker force has the opportunity to come in physical contact with the queen. The queen, in addition to laying eggs, 
she produces a large number of different chemicals which the workers get by coming in contact with her and those chemicals are needed for the efficient running and regulation of the colony. So her information is being processed, distributed through this method of working in shifts. What you see here of course is a worker at a flower. In the second half of their life, workers go out of the colony. First half of their life they work at home cleaning, guarding, feeding, etc. Second half of the life they go out and they collect pollen and nectar, bring it back to the colony and that is the source of food for the colonies. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about honeybees is that honeybees can be said to be altruistic. The very fact that worker bees will spend their whole lives not reproducing but spending all the time in rearing the queen's brood, in taking care of the colony is an act of altruism from the evolutionary point of view because they sacrifice their personal reproduction. The altruism of honeybees is in some ways even more spectacular. Not only will they spend their whole lives working for someone else but they will instantly commit suicide in order to protect their colony. If a honeybee stings you, that means death for that particular worker because when the honeybee worker pierces its sting into your body, she cannot withdraw it back because it has barbs pointing outwards and she tries to withdraw it, her abdomen ruptures and she will leave the sting, the poison gland and part of her digestive system hanging on your body to fly away and only to die within a few minutes. This of course is bad for the worker bee but this constitutes a very efficient venom delivery mechanism because even after the bee has gone away or you have chased her away, the poison gland which is attached to the sting which is still on your body continues to pump venom into your body. And people have actually measured that this pumping can go on for up to 60 seconds after the owner of the sting has flown away. So as you can imagine this is a very efficient method of venom delivery but it means death to the worker. And that is the speciality of these social insects. They are able to sacrifice themselves for the good of the group. Honeybees are not the only examples of social insects. Ants are very good examples. In fact, there are only about 10 or 12 species of honeybees which show this level of sociality. But there are 15,000 species of ants which show this kind of sociality with a queen, a few lazy workers, large num uh, drones and a large number of workers. Uh, this is a picture of what we call a weaver ant. There are two species in the world. These pictures are taken from the African uh, Ecophila uh, longinoda. We have the other species called Ecophila smaragdina. These are called weaver ants because they actually build nests on trees by stitching leaves together. And they actually stitch these leaves with silk fibers which, they them, which their larvae produce. In fact, you can see here a larva is being squeezed in order to donate silk for the community good which is being used actually to stitch these leaves together and then you actually get a nest. Ants have done something which the bees have not done and that is subgroups of ant workers who specialize in different tasks actually have evolved different body sizes and shapes. And in fact, as you can see here, these are all the members of a single colony of a single species. And you can see that their body shape and structure and size is suited for the kind of things they do. For example, this ant is very efficient at picking up small seeds and bringing them back to the colony, a task at which this ant would be hopeless. Whereas this ant would be very efficient at guarding a row of ants which are bringing back seeds against enemies, a task at which this ant would be hopeless. So there is specialization depending on the time uh, work they do. In fact, this has led to divergence, to dimorphism or polymorphism within a species. In fact, ants hold the world record in the animal kingdom for the extent of intraspecies intrasexual dimorphism. The world record is actually held by a Malaysian ant species and what you see here is the smallest member of the colony has been placed on the head of the largest member of the colony before taking a scanning electron micrograph. A friend of mine, Mark Moffett, took this picture. It turns out that this largest member of the colony weighs 500 times the size of the, uh, the weight of the smallest member of the colony. And I like, I'm very fond of reminding my molecular biology colleagues that these two individuals come from the same genome. It's the same genome that produces this divergence. Then my favorite kind of insect societies are the wasps. There are 
many hundreds of species of social wasps. All social wasps are called paper wasps. And the reason why they're called paper wasps is they build their nests not from wax as bees do, not from leaves as ants do, not from soil as termites do, but indeed from paper. That's why they're called paper wasps. Where do they get paper from? They manufacture paper. How do they manufacture paper? Exactly the same way that we would. They scrape cellulose fibers from plants, add various chemicals from their saliva, make it into a fine pulp, spread it into a thin layer, fan their wings and dry it, and you have paper. In fact, you can write on it. It is paper. Here is a nest uh, entirely covered with a paper envelope, leaving just a small opening for the wasps to fly in and out. And if you open that, you will see what I like to call a multi-storied apartment complex. What you have is several layers, again, of paper comb in which they actually rear their brood. Social life is, in some sense, extreme in the insects, but it's not absence among vertebrates. Many features of this social life you also see in vertebrates. There are very famous examples in birds which are called cooperative breeders. That means they cooperate in order to bring up young. An individual may not kill herself, may not become sterile for the whole life, but can spend a season, a year, helping parents to produce more offspring before they go off and produce their own offspring. This is a picture of a colony of the white-fronted beater, uh, bee eaters in, uh, on the bank of the lake Nakuru in Kenya, Kenya, and you see each one of these is a nest. Interestingly, in each nest, Sometimes, in addition to the mother and the father, you have three adult birds. You have a helper bird. And often this helper bird is one of the offspring produced in the last year's season who has stayed back to help the parents to produce more offspring. And the following year, this bird may or may not go off to start its own family. So, but it does show an act of altruism, at least for some time. Just as you have cooperative breeding birds, you also have cooperative breeding mammals. These are wild dogs in which, again, within a pack, usually only one pair breed at any given time. And the rest of the pack helps that pair to breed, takes care of the adults, parents, takes care of the offspring, brings food. And that is how they are able to survive in what might otherwise be a very harsh environment. Perhaps the cutest of social vertebrates is the meerkat. I'm, I'm, I can just look at this picture forever. They are extremely cute. But in addition to being cute, they are also very interesting. They are social in somewhat different ways, and they are actually challenging some of our theories. One of the most interesting things about meerkats is they compete with each other to take on risky tasks. There is a premium on risky tasks. They fight with each other saying, I want to do the most risky task. And we have to try and explain why this is true. We cannot stop talking about this without referring to humans, of course. We are social, we have cooperation, we have altruism of various kinds, but our sociality, our cooperation, our altruism is, of course, very much more varied. We are a very much more sophisticated species. I have three different pictures here to indicate three different contexts in which we might actually show altruism or some form of sacrifice. It's obvious here what that form is. It's obvious here what that form is. It's not so obvious what that is here. This is a boat race in Kerala. In fact, it turns out that it is the hardest kind of altruism or cooperation to explain is this rather than these. The, the question here, which we really don't have a good answer is, there are 20, 30, 40 people rowing trying to win a race. What prevents one guy from saying, they're all working so hard, why don't I take a break? and they don't take a break. And the question is, why do they not take a break? What is it that makes them all do this? This is something which is still quite a bit of paradox. Well, everything is a paradox. All of social behavior is a paradox. And what is the paradox? How does natural selection, which is expected to favor selfish competitiveness, if you even read Darwin's theory in, uh, in a high school textbook, you will see that natural selection is meant to favor selfish competitiveness. How does it promote the evolution of altruistic cooperation? That is the paradox. There is one major solution to this paradox, at least in theory, which we have, have had with us since about the middle of the 20th century. Perhaps the person to whom we must attribute this at the first instance is J.B.S. Haldane. 
J.B.S. Haldane is supposed to have famously declared that if one of my brothers is drowning in the lake, I will probably not consider it worthwhile to risk my life to save him. However, if three of my brothers are drowning, then I will probably risk my life to save that brother. Now, this story may be apocryphal, but Haldane did write a little article in which he said exactly this in a different context. Haldane's argument was that I share 50% of my genes with my brothers. If I die and say one brother, then only half my genes are recovered and this is not going to work and evolution will make the kinds of genes I have which make me jump into the lake and kill myself to say one brother, such genes will disappear from the population. However, if I die and save three of my brothers, then 1.5 copies of the genes in my body will actually survive for one copy that is lost. And if such altruistic genes make me do such things, then such altruist genes will actually increase in the population with time. So that was the crux of the idea. And my student has drawn not only the case for the brothers, but the derived case that you could think of for nephews, in which case Haldane should look the other way and said, only three nephews drowning, forget it, I'm not going to jump into the lake. But if five nephews are drowning, then of course it becomes 1.25 and it is worth drowning. So that's the crux of the idea. This idea was formalized by another English scientist called W.D. Hamilton, who proposed what we now call a rule. This is a simple mathematical rule, an inequality, which predicts when altruism should evolve and when altruism should not evolve. So the inequality is very straightforward. When R B minus C is greater than zero, altruism should evolve. B is the benefit to the altruist. C is the cost to the donor, to the altruist. So B minus C means the benefit is more than the cost. However, Hamilton realized that you cannot take benefit as it is because the benefit is accrued to somebody else and that somebody else does not share 100% of my genes. He's not my clone and therefore you must devalue the benefit by the proportion of genes I share with that individual. So if B is one and it, is, it goes to my brother, then it's only worth half because I only share half my genes with him. That's why you multiply B with R. R is the proportion of genes shared between the altruist and the recipient and therefore the corrected value of benefit minus cost, if it's greater than zero, then natural selection should favor the evolution of such altruistic behavior. In proposing such a rule, which Hamilton didn't call Hamilton's rule, but we do in, in admiration of him. But in doing so, he proposed a new definition of Darwinian fitness. Prior to that, the definition of Darwinian fitness was the number of offspring that are produced by an individual is the fitness of that individual. And Hamilton said, that is not complete. We have to have an extension of the definition of inclusive fitness, of fitness and he coined the term inclusive fitness. So inclusive fitness has two components, an old fashioned direct component, which is got through offspring production, which is what it was all about before Hamilton came, came to scene. But Hamilton said, to that you must add an indirect component that could be gained by aiding relatives. So I produce two sons and I save one brother from drowning. You should add this up and that becomes my fitness. And the nice thing about this is you can add them up because you can devalue them in appropriate relatedness. So I could produce one son, save two brothers, three nephews, four cousins. You can Each one you can multiply by the relatedness and add them all up and that becomes my inclusive fitness. So that's why this is this idea is sometimes called inclusive, sometimes called Hamilton's rule, sometimes called inclusive fitness theory, and sometimes very generally called kin selection theory, because the selection is based on kinship. The altruism is based on kinship. So in the literature, you'll find all of these three names. I will use them interchangeably. This is all fine, but an empiricist like me would say, this is very nice to write a paper. The question really I'm interested in is, do animals behave as if they obey Hamilton's rule? That's really what matters. If animals don't behave as if they obey the rule, then the rule is not of much value. It is not so easy to answer this question. One has to do a lot of things. And I will describe some effort that I and my students have made over the years to try and answer this question with reference to a wasp species that we work on. Ours is also a paper wasp. But it is not a paper wash which has a multi-storied apartment complex with a huge paper envelope. Those are 
nasty. Those are very hard to study. And I think they are nasty for another reason. They eat up the little wasps that I study. And I don't like them at all. The wasps I study are beautiful. They build simple paper nests, small nests, almost two-dimensional. And you can watch everything. You can put a camera, you can record everything, or you can see everything. You have adults, larvae, pupae, larvae, eggs. Everything can be watched. All interaction can be seen. They do not cover themselves with an envelope, and they do not construct a three-dimensional structure. And they are small. They are mild. They sting. Not so serious. You do get sting, but it's not very serious. So they are wonderful things to study. I've been studying them for over 40 years, and you can't stop uh, studying them. Now, in the context of this, and again, these colonies, like the honeybee colonies, like the ant colonies, one queen, several workers, a few lazy males. So let's leave, leave the males aside. Let's look at the queens and the workers. Now, it turns out that a male wasp who is born on such a colony stays in the colony of his birth for about a week, and then he leaves to lead a nomadic life never comes back to this nest, never goes to another nest, and he tries to mate with females from other colonies who are out trying to find food, and he dies eventually. So we'll leave the males out of the equation. If a female is born on a colony, she actually has a number of options open to her, and we can quantify how many wasps take option one, two, three, four. One option is she can leave the nest of her birth, she can go off on her own and say, I don't want to be part of any society. I'm going to build my own nest. I'm going to guard my own nest. I'm going to lay my own eggs. And I'm going to take care of my own offspring. And I'm going to bring them successfully to adulthood. This is possible. The nice thing about the wasps I study is while they can be social, they haven't forgotten to be solitary. They can live like a solitary insect. Another option would be to stay, say, I don't want to do any such risky thing. I'm going to stay back in my mother's nest. I'm going to spend my whole life helping her to produce offspring. I'm going to be a typical worker. There are other options, but we won't go into those details, because these are the two things we can contrast. L become selfish, solitary, leave and go off on your own, versus stay back, be altruistic, and work for somebody else. And we can ask the following question. When is it better? to be a sterile worker at home instead of being a fertile, solitary foundress outside. Because wasps do take these options. When is it better to do this? When is it better to do that? In the framework of Hamilton's rule, in the framework of inclusive fitness theory, this answer to this question is, it is better to do this if the inclusive fitness of a worker is in fact greater than the inclusive fitness of a solitary foundress. That's what the theory says. So, if the wasps are doing this, is this being satisfied? Now, in order to answer this question, what do we need to do? We need to measure empirically the inclusive fitness of a worker and the inclusive fitness of a solitary foundress. Unfortunately, this is not so easy. You cannot just go and measure these. You have to many more things. You have to make many more assumptions, many more simplifications. In order to make this as tractable as possible, what I have done is to break up the inclusive fitness into three different components, which are a little bit easier to measure. This is almost impossible, but three, each one into three different components, and I will define what those components are. So inclusive fitness is the product of three quantities, and I have defined in such a way that it is the product of these three quantities. What are the three quantities? There is an intrinsic productivity factor. How productive can I be? How much can I work? How many offspring can I take care of? That's one. That has to be multiplied, of course, by my genetic relatedness to those individuals that I take care of, because again, my altruism is being directed to someone who is not a clone, and this is equal to that R into B. But I have argued that this has to be further corrected further devalued but what I have defined as a demographic correction factor. This is because individuals die. In the real world, individuals die and they may begin by having, trying to do lots of work, but they may die before they complete their work. And that will have an effect on their inclusive fitness. And the probability of dying may be different for those who stay home and those who stay outside. Even more importantly, the consequence of dying may be very different 
for those receiving care if you are in a big nest at home where there are other people can take care of you or you are in a solitary nest where there is no one to take care of you. In particular, I am interested in the differential consequence of the death of the altruist to those who are receiving care. And that is what I am interested in. So I look at that and I will take you through a simple formulation. So I am simply going to look at these three factors and in the next two slides where I am going to have some equations and inequalities, I am going to use the letters B, R and S respectively for the intrinsic productivity factor, the coefficient of genetic relatedness and the demographic correction factor for a solitary foundress. So B, R, S would be the inclusive fitness of a solitary foundress. And for a worker, I am going to use the corresponding Greek letters. So it is going to be beta rho sigma. So beta rho sigma is the inclusive fitness of a worker. So we have six things to measure rather than two. That does not mean I can have six PhD students and say each one of you measure one thing and we are home. It does not work so easily. Even these six cannot be measured in any straightforward fashion fashion and so one has to make further simplifications. One has to simplify your equation in order to suit what you can do empirically. One have, you have to do your empirical work in order to suit your equations. So the minimum I said we should be able to do is we should be able to see when this inequality is possible. When is it that rho sigma beta, this product is greater than RSB. Now let us consider three extreme situations where this might happen. We have three parameters here. Let's take them one at a time. This inequality rho sigma beta greater than RSB may happen simply because rho is greater than R. Everything else being equal, that is sufficient to tilt this balance. And if that is what happens, then we are considering rho and R which are genetic relatedness terms. That means the worker is getting more inclusive fitness because she has more relatedness to the offspring she is taking care of compared to the solitary foundress. This inequality is happening. The inclusive fitness of a worker is greater than solitary foundress because the relatedness of the worker to the brood she is taking care of is greater than the relatedness of the solitary foundress to the brood that she is taking care of. So I call this genetic relatedness predisposition. If this obtains in a particular species, then that species may become altruistic, may evolve such social life. and. Why does it do so? Because it is predisposed to the evolution of social life because of asymmetries in genetic relatedness. So there is a genetic relatedness asymmetry in this species which is why it becomes social. Alternatively, you could have a situation where sigma is greater than s. The demographic correction factors are asymmetric such that, I will now spill the beans, such that the consequences of a worker dying for the brood under her care may not be as serious as the consequence of a solitary wasp dying for the brood which she is caring for. If that is true, then sigma will be greater than s. There is a demographic predisposition in such a species. A species may have the kind of biology, the kind of ecology, the kind of life cycle such that in fact sigma is greater than s. And if such a species is present in a harsh environment, then it is predisposed to evolve social life. Finally, you could have beta greater than b, that is the intrinsic productivity may be different for a worker and a solitary foundress. This can happen for two kinds of reasons. It can happen for ecological reasons. If I am part of a large nest, I have help and therefore I can do more. If I am alone, I have difficulty. It can also happen for physiological reasons. It could be that the individual who chooses to go out may be physiologically different from the one who chooses to stay at home. So physiologically there may be asymmetries in this individual giving rise to this kind of asymmetry. And if that is what is happening in a species, then I would define such a species as being ecologically or physiologically predisposed to the evolution of altruism, to the evolution of sociality. And this is how I am going to try and answer the question, does Ropalidia marginata obey Hamilton's rule? That is my framework and I am going to try and do this. Now in order to find out, so it is these inequalities that I will try to measure. So let us begin with rho versus r, the genetic relatedness terms. If this is happens and this is what is causing the evolution of sociality, there is a word for it, it is called nepotism. 
because basically individuals are indulging in nepotism. They are helping those who are more closely related to them. And I will come back to this because there is something special about this inequality compared to these two. In a way, this is given. These are difficult. This is more likely than these. That's what theory tells us. And this is because of the peculiar kind of genetics that ants, bees, and wasps have. Their genetics is not like our genetics. They are not deployed like us. They are not entirely sexually reproducing like us. They are partly parthenogenetic. They are haploid as well as diploid. In ants, bees, and wasps, all males are haploid. All females are diploid. A female ant, bee, or wasp mates with a male gather sperm from the male and stores it in a gland called the spermatheca. She doesn't use it immediately. She can store it there for days, months, years, decades. It has been shown ants can store that. They will nurture that sperm. They will have accessory glands which produce chemicals and they will keep that sperm in viable condition for long periods of time and use it whenever they want. They will use it by allowing the sperm to flow from the spermatheca, this uh, organ is called, it is attached through a duct to the oviduct and as the egg is being laid, they will, uh, they will relax the muscles of that duct, sperm will flow, the egg will get fertilized, a diploid egg will be uh, laid and she will give rise to a daughter. If they want to produce a son, they will block the flow of sperm, no fertilization, a haploid egg will be laid, which is viable, which will grow up into a fully functional, viable, fertile male. So males are haploid, females are diploid. And because of that, there are very curious asymmetries in genetic relatedness. We have already seen that much of this story has to do with asymmetries in relatedness. There are curious asymmetries in relatedness. And therefore, you could have, if you had rho greater than r, which is nepotism, and this is possible in a diploid organism because everybody is diploid. Eggs and sperms are produced through meiosis, through reduction division. Each egg has half the genes of the parent. Each sperm has half the genes of the parent. And because there is random segregation of the chromosomes, on average, two daughters who have the same mother and same father will be related to each other by one half. They share one half of their genes. They share 50 percent of their maternal genes because two eggs will share 50 percent of the genes because only half the randomly chosen chromosomes will be sent to each egg. Similarly, two sperm will be related to each other by half and therefore on the paternal side also they are related by half. There are equal number of maternal and paternal genes and therefore on average two sisters will be related to each other by half in a diploid organism. But not so in a haplodiploid organism. In a haploid organism, the father is haploid to start with. There is no question of meiosis. There is no question of reduction division. There is no question of random segregation of chromosomes. He produces my, the sperm by mitosis. All his sperms are clones of each other. Whereas eggs are haploid and they are only 50 percent related to the mother. Two sisters who have the same mother and same father in a haplodiploid species, such as an ant or a bee or a wasp, are related to each other by three quarters, not by half. They are related to each other by half on the maternal side, because two different eggs, but by one on the paternal side, because the sperms are clones of each other. So two sisters are related by three quarters. So a female is related to her sister by three quarters, to her daughter only by half. So she should take care of her sister and not her daughter. She will get more inclusive fitness if she takes care of her sister than her daughter. And you can already see how we are getting close to Hamilton's rule, at least in theory. Therefore, rho should be 0.75 and r should be 0.5. Rho is greater than r and therefore altruism should evolve. Nepotism itself should be adequate for the evolution of social behavior. At one time, Again, it was Hamilton who realized this. There was great excitement because there was a ready-made solution to the paradox of altruism. At that time, 12 different independent origins of youth sociality were known. And if you look at the tree of life, there were 12 times de novo selfish creatures had become altruistic, 12 times. 11 were in the insect order Hymenoptera, ants, bees, wasps, where there is haplodiploidy, where rho is greater than r. Only once outside of that in the termites. In fact, the 
ants, bees, and wasps, haplodiploid species, constitute 2% of the animal kingdom. In 2% of the animal kingdom, there were 11 origins of sociality. In 98% of the animal kingdom, there was one origin of sociality. What better evidence do you want for the importance of haplodiploidy and related asymmetry, rho greater than r, nepotism? So this was an extremely exciting period. So much excitement is not good in science. There must be a catch somewhere. Indeed, there is a catch because you will notice that this is true only if the mother and the father is the same. We know that ant, bee, wasp, queens mate with many males, store sperm from many males, keep them in the sperm theca, and then they can use sperm from different males. And therefore, you can have stepsisters instead of full sisters. Same mother, but different fathers. We call them half sisters. And then, of course, everything goes for a toss because if you have two sisters who have the same mother, different father, they will share 50% gene on the maternal side but zero on the paternal side because two different fathers on average 0.25, one fourth. Now a daughter is much better, daughter is by half whereas the sister is only by one quarter and now the whole thing is reversed. So the crucial question is do the queens mate multiply? Do they gather sperm from different males? Do they mix them up? And at any given time, are they producing a mixture of full sisters or a mixture of half sisters? That becomes the question. And therefore, we decided to ask what happens in Ropalidia marginata. These were old days in the 19, early 1990s, and we used allozyme, isozyme, protein markers to genotype mothers and their daughters and therefore infer the genotype of the father. If you genotype the mother and the daughter, you can infer the genotype of the father because the other allele in the daughter has to come from the father. By this process, we set up laboratory colonies and we were able to show that even in small colonies where they hardly produce 10 to 12 daughters, Ropalidia marginata queens were mating with one, two, or three different males gathering sperm from them, mixing it up, and producing a mixture of full and half sisters. On average, we found that the average relatedness amongst the daughters in the colonies was 0.53, not different from 0.5. So the advantage of 0.75 had been lost. It had been brought back to 0.5. So now both are equal. Go off and produce your own daughters, or stay back and take care of this. It makes no difference. So already the power of the theory has gone. But it was destined to fall even further because what we showed by studying our wasps is in these wasps, unlike in honeybees and ants and termites, all adult wasps are born more or less equal. Anybody can become a queen and anybody can become a worker and therefore queens are often chased away by their daughters who become the future queens. I told you one option is leave and go on your own, second option is stay and work for your mother. There is a third option. Stay and work for your mother for some time and then at the appropriate time chase her away and install yourself as the queen of that colony. Now when you do that, the mothers are changing. Now this we have observed. What was even more interesting is when that happens, the workers who are the offspring of the previous queen don't seem to care. They continue to work exactly as before. So when this turnover happens, you have two kinds of matri lines. Workers who are daughters of the previous queen, workers who are daughters of the future queen, and therefore now the offspring not only have different fathers, but they can also have different mothers, and you can have different matrilines. So we set up, a, this was very exciting for us, we set up an elaborate study lasting two years where we took natural colonies, we marked every color, marked every wasp, and we kept track of every wasp, every egg, every adult, every pupa, and over years, we kept track of this, and through that, we were able to construct pedigrees. We were able to find out the genetic relationship of every pair of wasps, whether egg, larva, pupa, or adult. This egg versus that adult, what is the relatedness? This pupa versus that larva, what is the relatedness? We were able to calculate all of this simply by doing a pedigree analysis, and we found that indeed queens change, and therefore, you can construct pedigrees. The most complex pedigree we constructed is this. 
So we, had, we saw 10 queens through the course of our study. Queen number one was replaced by her daughter. Queen number two was replaced by her sister, even though there were some other daughters available. This was replaced by another sister. But this queen was raised, re, replaced by her niece. And this queen was replaced by her cousin. So queens can be replaced by their daughters or sisters or nieces or cousins. Probably even further relatedness, but our data, we stopped at this. Now, we also knew how much brood was there at any given time. So we could also calculate the relatedness to brood. And from this, we made the following calculation. That new queens, relationship between queens and their immediate predecessor is that of daughters, sisters, nieces, and nephews. And therefore, the relatedness keeps falling. Remember, this is immediate predecessor. Sometimes two, three queens change in rapid time. So you have two, three, four matrix lines simultaneously happening, which of course makes the relatedness even lower. And because of that, we were able to calculate in these set of four natural colonies the average relatedness between a worker who works, who is an altruist, and the brood that she's taking care of. And this was the greatest surprise in our research. We found, to our great surprise, that the relationship between workers and the brood can be that of sisters, brothers, nieces and nephews, cousins, cousins' offspring, mother's cousins, mother's cousins' offspring, and even mother's cousins' grandchildren. I'm very fond of saying that Ropalidia marginata will put to shame any Indian joint family. <laughs> no family can live in such a complex environment. Not only did we know this, but we knew the frequency of each of these things. And therefore, we were able to calculate an average relatedness. And we put a, built a simple model in which we put all of this information with their frequencies and with the probabilities of multiple mating. So the two things together, when queens mate multiply, we call that polyandry. If a colony has multiple queens, we call it polygyny. So combining polyandry and polygyny, we showed that the average relatedness can really be very, very low. It can actually range from 0.22 to 0.46. In fact, not even touching 0.5. So the asymmetry has gone further down. And therefore, nepotism doesn't work. Sigma is 0 0.2 to 0.4, and R is 0 0.5. And therefore, no genetic relatedness predisposition and haplodiploid. In fact, the whole idea that sigma is automatically greater than R 0.75.5 came to be known at that time in the literature as the haplodiploidy hypothesis. And the haplodiploidy hypothesis does not work. Challenge to the great man Hamilton himself. But one has to be careful. This may not be true. It's very important to try and pick holes in your own results. The more exciting the result, the more you should try and pick holes in it. Maybe this is wrong. Maybe we are mistaken. Because we are calculating in a different context, it may well be. So nepotism is not adequate, this data shows. However, what if the wasps behave nepotistically by preferentially showing altruism only to those close relatives and not to everybody else? Why should we assume that the worker will feed everybody? She may say, oh, you are my full sister. I will feed you. You are my half sister. You can starve. Maybe they do that. And if they did that, then they restore this asymmetry. So we set up another very elaborate study. This one lasted almost three years to understand how the wasps recognize or don't recognize other individuals. I'll make a very long story, very short, and just say that we were able to show that while the wasps have very good abilities to discriminate nest mates versus non-nest mates, they had very poor ability to discriminate closely related nest mates from distantly related nest mates. Once you're in the colony, you're all equal. I can't review tell apart. And the reason why this happens, again, to make a long story very short, we showed that when wasp has to make a recognition, the wasp which is going to make the recognition must have a template in its brain, which tells it who is my sister and who is not. And the wasp which is being recognized should have a label on its body saying, I'm your sister. And we showed that both the templates and the labels are not present in the wasp at birth. These labels and templates are acquired by the wasp after birth by interacting with the nestmates. So everybody has the same label and the same template. 
you can certainly tell who does not belong to your nest because you have not interacted with them. You don't have their labels and templates. But within the colony, it doesn't make it. And we have proved this in many, many different ways. We have created genetically mixed colonies and shown that there is no intra-colony discrimination. And therefore, we can rule out this possibility. And therefore, we can say that nepotism is not possible. Haploid relatedness asymmetry is not adequate because it's broken down and nepotism is not possible. Still more cautious. What if the wasps behave nepotistically only while choosing the new queens? Who cares how much I feed a wasp which is going to become a worker? Doesn't matter. It's not going to contribute to my fitness. I indiscriminately show altruism to everybody, feed everybody, because I want these workers to come and work. And then when I have to choose my next queen, that's when I'm going to go for my full system. Then it doesn't matter. So it's entirely this is possible. So we set up another study to see whether this is true. And what we did here was, this was more modern times, so we used microsatellite markers and we genotyped all the wasps in several colonies. And we asked, when the queen turned over, so, and we had to do this over a long period of time, because when the queen will change is not in our hands. Sometimes, of course, you can do it artificially. You can remove a queen and see who becomes the next queen. So when we did these experiments, we had a theoretical prediction. Let us say, let us assume, in fact, these wasps are very smart. They will choose the ones who are closest related to them when it becomes the next queen. So we made a, uh, again, to give you some biology, if you remove the queen in these colonies, one of the workers will immediately become the next queen. If you remove that, another worker will become the next queen. If you remove that, yet another one will become the next queen. In fact, there's a long queue of individuals waiting to become subsequent queens. So we could do this experiment where we sequentially removed the queens and we had an order. Queen one, queen two, three, four, five, six. And we said, what is our prediction? Because we genotyped everybody. If the most closely related individual is to be chosen, who should be queen one, two, three, four, five, six? So we make a prediction. Then we do the experiment. And we see who became queen one, two, three, four, five, six, and ask how much mismatch there is between the prediction based on the assumption that the most closely related will be chosen versus actual absurd. And the way we calculated discrepancy, we called it queue jumping. How often did an individual jump the queue? It's not my turn. I am not the most closely related, but I become the next queen. And we showed that there's enormous queue jumping. In fact, there is great discrepancy between the theory and expected. In fact, on average, six individuals jump the queue every time a new queen is found. So in fact, it turns out that wasps do not choose their queens based on genetic relatedness. Nepotism is not practiced. In one case, nepotism was not adequate, was not possible. In other case, it's not practiced. In other case, it was not adequate. And only at this point, we said, we have disproved the haplodiploidy hypothesis. I must say that other people also had disproved it by using different kinds of methods, but by using these methods, we said that we have disproved the haplodiploidy hypothesis. Nepotism is not adequate, not possible, or not practiced. Therefore, Ropolidia marginera is not predisposed to the evolution of social behavior because of relatedness asymmetries. Doesn't matter, we have three, two more. We have three possibilities, right? So other things to do. So let's go back and now look at beta versus B. This is ecological or physiological predisposition. Here we did a very different kind of experiment. We wanted to know what is the intrinsic productivity of individuals who stay and individuals who leave. Now, one of the mistakes that people often make in this kind of analysis is they look at individuals who are workers in the colony, find out their productivity, so some value x. Then they look at individuals who are solitary, look at their productivity y, and they say is x greater than y, is x less than y. This is wrong because an individual who has voluntarily chosen to stay back may not be physiologically the same as the individual who has voluntarily decided to go back. A worker is only sacrificing as much as she could have produced if she had gone back. But she hasn't gone back, she has stayed back and you're measuring her productivity. So this doesn't work. So we have to somehow measure the productivity of a worker, what it would have been if she had gone away. How do you do that? It's possible. So one of my students did a very large field study. He identified a large number of newly formed colonies. 
where still not much had happened. A few cells, a few eggs. Some of these colonies were started by a single female, the first option. Some of them were started by groups of females. So I already gave you three options. There is a fourth option. A wasp can leave her mother's nest, but with a group of females and build a new nest in which she can be either a queen or a worker. So now there is this fourth option. So some nests were started by one, some with multiple. So the ones which were started by one wasp, he said, I won't disturb these. These are my controls. And I'm going to measure their productivity because these are voluntary solitary foundresses. But those nests in which there were groups of females, he divided them randomly into two sets. In one of them, he said, I'm going to remove the queen and I'm going to randomly remove all but one worker. Now, a worker who want, uh, wanted to be a worker is forced to be a solitary foundress because everybody is removed. Now, we measure her productivity. So, what would her productivity if she is forced to be alone? So, these are forced solitary. Now, this manipulation may cause some disturbance and therefore, there was a second kind of control which is the other half of the group where he removed all the workers and left the queen alone. If there was a problem of manipulation, then the queen also should suffer. So now we compared the productivity of voluntary solitary, forced solitary, and forced solitary queen. And we got a remarkable result that the queens were forced to be alone, and the natural solitary had the same productivity. It is only the workers who are forced, the co-founders who are alone, had a significantly lower productivity. And that's why we wrote a paper asking, do social wasps choose their nesting strategies based on their brood rearing abilities? That's what seems to happen. In other words, wasps who are confident go out, and even if they're not joined by anybody, they successfully produce offspring. And sometimes they're joined by others. So in fact, we must be comparing this with this. So when you do that, we actually can show that beta is in fact greater than B. This turns out to be 12.3. This turns out to be 4. So the intrinsic productivity of the workers is in fact greater than the intrinsic productivity of the solitary foundresses. And therefore, there is an ecological or physiological predisposition for the evolution of eusociality in this species. So this works. And we have one more up our sleeve, and that is the demographic predisposition. Now, this is again uh, based on a study lasting many years. I'll try and shorten it as much as I can. Demography had not been studied well in insects. People do not think that insects are worth studying demographically. It's only vertebrates, humans, which live very long lives who worry about demography. Insects are not considered. So we decided to focus on demography of these wasps. And I built a hierarchy of mathematical models to understand this. I will not go through the details. I will just give you one model. I'll illustrate this with one model. And this model, I called it, I gave it a name. I called it the model of assured fitness returns. The idea is as follows. If I'm a solitary wasp, if I go off on my own and I lay eggs, then I wait for the eggs to become larvae. Then I take care of the larvae. I wait for the larvae to become pupae. Then I wait, I wait until they become adults. I'm in charge. I better not die. If I die, within minutes, ants will come and eat up everything. So unless I survive for the entire brood developmental period, all my investment is lost. I have no assured returns for my investment. But if I'm a worker living in a large nest where there are many other workers, and I'm taking care of a few of them, if I die, somebody else will chip in. The work I have put in until the day of my death does not go a waste. Somebody will continue that. And therefore, mathematically, I can partition the fitness half for the one came after and half for me. If I did half the work, I get half, the other one gets half. So in other words, even if I die as a worker, I have relatively more assured returns for the investment I have made until I died. If I am solitary, I have no such assurance. That's why I call this the assured fitness returns model. The idea is that eggs become larvae, become pupae, become adults. A solitary foundress has to necessarily survive for the entire period. But workers can divide labor serially. One worker can work for some time, die, then another takes over, and another takes over. Together, they can bring up eggs to adulthood, whereas a solitary will never do it. In our species, this period takes on average 62 days. 
Imagine if the lifespan of a worker is less than 62 days. Then a solitary foundress will never manage because she will always die before the commanders. But workers can because they can team up together serially. And that's why I call this. And I came up with a mathematical way of calculating the advantage of assured fitness. So basically, again, to make it very brief, what I did was I calculated in the population what is the distribution of the lifespans of the wasps. And based on that, I calculated how much advantage do workers have because of assured fitness returns. In other words, I calculated fitness for a solitary wasp in this fashion. You get zero fitness up to 62 days, and then you get it in one, sh one shot. It's like getting a monthly salary. For my workers, my workers are daily wage workers. You work for one day, you get one by 62. You work for two days, you get two by 62. So for workers, I calculated fitness in this fashion, and I found out how, of how when do the workers die? What is the probability that a worker will die before 62 days? And I calculated that, and I summed up over this, and that's how I set up a simple for, this is 62 days, and this is the rate at which workers die. So based on this, I set up a simple equation where I said for a solitary foundress, the demographic correction factor is 0 0.12 because I calculated that 0 0.12 is the probability that a worker will be alive for 62 days. It's a very simple number. So there is 0 0.12 is the current demographic correction factor. Whatever work a solitary foundress, multiply it by 0 0.122 because that's the probability that she'll be alive. But for a worker, you have to add up. So I said what we have to do is for, depending on how long they live, you have to keep on adding fitness and after 62 days, they still live longer, you give them a fitness of one. And using this equation, I calculated the demographic correction factor for a worker to be 0 0.43. And as you can see, there is a significant inequality. I won't go into these details, but the inequality is that 0 0.43, of course, is much greater than 0 0.12. And therefore, there is a demographic predisposition. In other words, in this species, there is no genetic predisposition or genetic relatedness predisposition. There is some physiological predisposition, some ecological predisposition. We have done other experiments to break this up, which I won't go into, and there is a substantial demographic predisposition. So there is hope to believe that these was obey Hamilton's rule. Now, this left me somewhat unsatisfied because I don't like four answers to a question. I need one answer. Can I somehow combine all of this and have a unified model which will allow me to answer this question? Do the wasps obey or not? I want a simple answer. And so I tried to build a unified model. And I asked myself, what do I want my unified model to do? Ideally, I would like my unified model to tell me, I pick up a wasp, should she leave or should she stay? This one, should she leave or should she stay? I would love to be able to do that, but I am light years away from th even imagining how I might do that. So I settled for something less ambitious. I said, can I predict what fraction of the population should leave and what fraction should stay? This seemed somewhat more tractable. I did that, many simplifications which I won't go into, but finally I came up with the result that about 5% of them should volunteer, go out, risk be solitary, but the remaining should prefer to stay back. Once I got this, I had a student who again did a large field study and he was able to corroborate this by actually showing that in the field, 92.5 to 94% actually nest in groups and only 4 to 65% actually nest solitary. So this is a remarkable agreement with the theoretical result. It is not the quantitative numbers that we should pay attention to, but simply the qualitative result that the model predicts that a very small fraction should leave and an overwhelming number should stay, and the, result, the field results show that a very small fraction leave and an overwhelming fraction actually stays. That is the, the qualitative fit is what I am interested in. So we have the answer that yes, this is possible. I summarize this saying the following. Perhaps the single most important point that these results make is that ecological, physiological, and demographic factors can be more important in promoting the evolution of eusociality than the genetic relatedness asymmetries created by haplodiploidy. Put in another way, the benefit and cost terms in Hamilton's rule deserve more attention than the relatedness. I said this because I find that most people are interested in measuring relatedness. 
measuring cost and benefit is very tedious, very difficult, hard field work and nobody wants to do that. Measuring relatedness is very expensive and people love it. Have an expensive lab, get a big grant, grind up the wasp, measure relatedness. But if you only measure relatedness without these, it's not going to work. And I tried to sell the idea that we must do these things. The second part, I will make it very brief. At the end of all of this, I should have felt triumphant. For a while, I felt triumphant. And then somebody pricked a hole in the balloon and a huge controversy came up. E.O. Wilson, the very man who had made this theory very famous, although Hamilton proposed a theory, it was Wilson who made this very famous, along with two mathematicians, Martin Novak and Corina Tarnita, in 2010, they wrote a paper in Nature saying this doesn't work. In fact, they, the paper was called Evolution of Sociality, but they argued that Inclusive fitness theory is a particular mathematical approach that has many limitations. It is not a general theory of evolution. Inclusive fitness is often wrongly defined. Hamilton's rule almost never holds, was their conclusion by reviewing the entire literature. Now, many people who had invested their career in this were, of course, very upset. And there was a huge back backlash. Lots of papers were written in Nature. One of them was actually almost a petition written, signed by 150 people saying Wilson and company are wrong and inclusive fitness is in fact very important. Now their attack on inclusive fitness took many forms. If you look at the published and if you look at the oral, it took many forms. Some of them said there's nothing wrong, there's nothing new, it's all been said before, which is a strange thing to say because it means we all agree that it is not correct. Okay, but it's not worth publishing in nature. This I heard uh, over beer and coffee very, very often. <laughs> Creationists and other anti-science folks will use it to attack evolution. The public will be confused. Worst of all, students will be confused. <laughs> this was not a very happy situation for me. So although I was invited to sign that petition, I refused to sign that petition. And I said I'm going to give my own response. Since the publication of the paper, I've actually had a bonanza. I thought this chapter was closed and I was doing other things. And now I have become very active in this field and I have at least had four projects inspired entirely by this controversy. I've written at least four papers inspired by this controversy. The first thing I did was, my first step was to make my own response. Very briefly, my response, I won't read this, my response was the following. Yes. I agree that the haploidy plurality hypothesis has failed, which is one of the things they said, I agree. Excess or exclusive focus on relatedness is bad, I agree. Lack of mathematical generality and equivalence with standard natural selection, one of their claims, that this is not general enough. I say, I don't know. I am not competent to judge. I am not going to jump and say they are wrong or they are right, I don't know. And finally, paucity of biological insight this is subjective, it is debatable. I got a great deal of insight, maybe some have not. So my reaction was much more tempered. And I said that for the healthy growth of science, it is useful to periodically rock the boat. And when a body of knowledge grows into a large ship, we need giants like Wilson to rock it. And I said, let us hope that inclusive fitness theory and the standard natural selection theory flourish side by side in the service of empiricists. The main point that Wilson et al. were making is that there's an old method of doing calculation, standard population genetics, that is enough. We don't need inclusive fitness theory. And I'm saying, why not have both? But that is not how the community reacted. Controversy continued, there were lots of papers. Somebody said, what's wrong with inclusive fitness? Somebody replied, there's nothing wrong with inclusive fitness. <laughs> Kin selection is the key to altruism, somebody said. Group selection and kin selection are formally equivalent. Group selection and inclusive fitness are not equivalent. So this went on. So at some point I said, I should try and do a study of the scientists. Why are they behaving in this fashion? So after some years, I actually wrote a paper trying to critique the response of others. And I felt, I may be wrong, my impression was that a large number of biologists who felt that they had invested their whole career in this were somehow betrayed. 
my life's work has gone. So they felt compelled to say this must be wrong. The theory must be correct. And these theories, the mathematics is quite complicated and biologists really don't understand. I, even today I say, I cannot judge whether the inclusive fitness mathematics is sufficiently general or not. I don't have the training to judge. It is better for me to say that I can't judge. So I wrote a paper with the title, how should biologists engage with controversial mathematical theory? <laughs> I suggest one disclaimer and three responsibilities. Biologists who are testing mathematical theory, who cannot understand theory, must publicly make one disclaimer, but that will only be useful if you are willing to take three responsibilities along with that. The disclaimer is, be cognitively aware and publicly admit that we do not fully understand and therefore cannot attest to the veracity of the mathematics. <laughs> Say it publicly. There is no shame in that. And create a publicly accepted consensus that it is okay to test mathematical models without fully understanding the mathematics behind it. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. That's their job. But this will only work if you take three responsibilities. What are the responsibilities? First is stay bipartisan in a controversy. As soon as there's a fight between two mathematics, don't jump in and say he's right because I have used his theory. So we have to stay bipartisan. And I have shown in this paper, I have looked at the literature and shown how people have, who should have stayed bipartisan have not stayed bipartisan. Number two, stay vigilant. Whenever there is rumblings among mathematicians, pay attention to that. Don't try to hide it into the carpet. Be interested in, in this controversy. So stay vigilant. And my final thing, sometimes some people think it's controversial, but I really believe in this. Biologists must make their biology larger than the mathematics. We don't do biology just to serve some mathematician. Mathematician can pick and choose what we have found. Biology is larger than the mathematics. We provide a large body of knowledge which mathematicians can use. I'm not going to spend my whole life testing Hamilton's rule. I, my goal is, I tell my students, I want to understand everything that is humanly possible to understand about Rappaladia marginata. I don't care which mathematician is interested or not. Then let the mathematician mine this data. So biology should become larger than the mathematics. So that was my second response. My third response is, if I have been saying all of this, should I not re-examine our own data? So I spent a couple of years re-examining all our data and soul searching. Ask myself, do I really think Hamilton's rule has worked? Or do I think it is not adequate? So I spent a lot of time brooding over this. And I wrote another paper saying that evolution of social behavior in the primitive use of the marginata, do we need to look beyond kin selection? And I said, I asked myself, if social behavior and altruism are the products of kin selection, why has there been selection for the following features? Lowering and irrelevance of relatedness, polyandry and polygyny, nest foundation by unrelated, all this we have documented, by unrelated individuals, why should they do that? Acceptance of young non-nest mates into the colony who are not related, why? Combination of nest mate recognition and lack of intra-colony kin recognition. Why has natural selection favored this? Combination of meek and docile queens and decentralized uh, workforce. Why? Cryptic hair designates. I haven't given you the details, but a number of features, law, all of these are not easy to explain. They are not required for kin selection to work. So I said, is kin selection sufficient? Probably not sufficient. Good, but not sufficient. Is it necessary? Probably not. There may be other theories. Let's keep our minds open. So my conclusion from the third response is skin selection may have been a useful, may have been useful to explain some aspects of social behavior and altruism in our marginata, but we must be open to other ideas which may be good or even better. Who knows? Why should we close and say this theory is the best theory forever and after? In particular, we should add individual selection and multi-level selection to our toolkit to, to demystify evolution. I have a fourth response. I'll take one more minute. In the fourth response, I did the following. It turns out that these people, Wilson, Novak, and, uh, and Corina Tarnita, are actually sort of being shunned by the community. They're not invited to conferences. Nobody wants to talk to them. I said, that's a wrong approach. So I went, uh, I went to Harvard. I talked to them. I made friends. I said, I'm interested in what you're doing. Can we do something together? So you have built a model, but let us try and re-examine one of the 
most important successes of using inclusive fitness theory with your method and let's see what happens. I will supply the biological information, not my own work, but. Uh, so this is a theory which is called worker policing. Because of haploidiploidy, a worker is related to her nephews by 0.375, half of 0.75, brothers by 0.25. So she should prefer nephews over brothers if she has a choice, if the queen is singly mated. But if the queen is multiply mated, nephews become 0.125, half of 0.25, whereas brothers remain 0.25. So she should now prefer brothers. So in a colony, if the mother is singly mated, worker should prefer nephews. If the mother is multiply mated, they should prefer brothers and not nephews. Now, not preferring nephews means if my other sisters are trying to lay eggs, I should destroy their eggs because they are my nephews. I should and I should only lay the queen's, take care of the queen's eggs. This is called worker policing theory. And there's a lot of evidence in favor of this theory. In fact, worker policing has been thought of as a triumph of kin selection. Worker policing should evolve, the theory says, when queens mate multiply, but it should not evolve when queens mate singly. Workers should not eat up each other's eggs if the queen is mated singly. Only when the queen is mated multiply, and this has been thought of as a triumph of this theory, has been hailed. I said, let's look at this carefully using your methods. And we published a paper recently, and we were able to show that policing can evolve in species with singly mated queens if it causes minute increase in colony efficiency. There is another reason for worker policing. And if there is a small increase in colony efficiency, even in singly mated colonies, it can evolve. Policing does not evolve in species multiply mated queens if it causes minute decrease in colony efficiency. For non-monotonic efficiency functions, it is possible that single mating allows evolution of policing while multiple mating opposes it. So you can get exactly the opposite results by small variations in parameters. And that is why I think we should be open to different kinds. I'm not saying this is final, but this is one more step. We should be open to all of these possibilities. In general, there's nothing more helpful for the growth of good science than a bitter controversy. It may not leave good taste in the mouth, but for the growth of science, controversies are extremely useful. I'm sorry to have taken so much time. I want to spend one more minute saying none of these would have been possible, but for a very large number of passionate students who work with me over the years. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you.